Hello, everyone. Now, I know that it's hard to keep up on top of what's going on in the Holy Land, but if you want to know more about what's happening here in Israel, I'm Aaron Porras, and this is the Weekly Review. As tensions escalate between Israel and Iran, a series of unusual security incidents taking place in Israel since Wednesday. First, an explosion at a missile factory near the central city of Ramle. Before official comments, Iranian media praised the blast, saying it took place at a, quote, sensitive military industrial site. It quoted eyewitnesses as seeing flames at a great height. Israeli media say the explosion was part of a routine test at a facility for advanced weapons. Overnight, a surface-to-air missile launched from Syria, setting off red alert sirens near Israel's top-secret nuclear reactor in Dimona. The IDF activated its air defense systems in an attempt to intercept the missile. However, the attempt apparently failed. In response, the IDF attacked several missile batteries in Syria, including the one that fired the projectile that struck its territory. Syria's state news agency said Syrian air defenses intercepted the Israeli attack. Syrian media reported four soldiers injured in those strikes. Iran's nuclear program slowed but reportedly back on track. Officials in Tehran alleging that the power has been fully restored at the Natanz uranium enrichment facility following a recent explosion on its power grid. And what's more, Iran is saying that they've identified the culprit behind the April 11 blast. This is Riza Karimi. The man Iran is now blaming for the sabotage at the Natanz nuclear enrichment facility, which Iran is also still blaming on Israel. And Tehran is announcing Karimi's identity, saying that he fled the country just before the blast, adding that they've requested Interpol's help in returning him to the country for prosecution, though his connection to Israel and the blast itself is still unclear, as is whether or not Interpol is actually helping, a search on Interpol's website for Karimi coming up empty. Likewise, while Iran is saying that the damages caused in the explosion have been reversed and production resumed, details of the activities resuming have not been published, and experts are claiming that considerable damage had been caused at Natanz, likely setting the facility's capabilities back by months. Thousands of centrifuges used to enrich uranium are said to have been destroyed or damaged when a 150-kilogram bomb took out the main and backup power supplies at the plant. Meantime, beyond alleged involvement in setting up the attack, Israel preparing to send a delegation to Washington, D.C., in hopes of lobbying U.S. officials to push for tighter oversight over Iran's nuclear program. This, as Iranian and American negotiating teams in Vienna are said to be quickly resolving issues blocking a return to the JCPOA nuclear deal. That said, Israel is supposedly resigned to the fact that the deal will still fail to address Tehran's ballistic missile program and support for global terror groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthi rebels. A disgusting display in Jerusalem Sunday and Monday as Jewish-Arab tensions rising in the city. Police arresting six Jewish suspects allegedly connected to a number of anti-Arab attacks. The suspects accused of having assaulted an Arab man and throwing stones at supposedly Arab vehicles. Witnesses describing a mob of young religious Jewish men making their way through downtown Jerusalem, questioning passers-by and attacking those with Arabic accents. Meanwhile, footage of the supposed mob showing dozens chanting death to Arabs and other racist slogans until police arrived on scene to give chase. This incident, coming after massive anti-Israel and anti-Jewish riots in both Jerusalem and in South Tel Aviv, however, coinciding with the Muslim holy month of Ramadan and a string of recent indiscriminate attacks against Jews, Palestinians filming themselves and sharing videos on social media of clashes with police and assaults. The latest example being from Monday evening when a Haredi Jewish teen can be seen riding his bike in Jerusalem before three Arab youths come into frame and accost him before running away. Security forces fearing that the tensions are only on the rise. Now on a personal note, I myself and everyone at ILTV unequivocally condemn all of the violence against civilians and the hate speech, both against Jews and against Arabs. It's disgusting, it's unjustifiable, racist, and it serves only to divide the country. I pray only that the perpetrators on both sides are held to account and are punished to the full extent of the law. Moving on, the debate over poor and underserving treatment for wounded IDF veterans is far from over. Hundreds, if not thousands, of wounded veterans of all ages coming out to support reforms on Sunday in a protest that brought major thoroughfares with Tel Aviv to a standstill. The protesters galvanized by veteran Itzik Saidian, who just last week set himself on fire. 
and many in the crowds similarly expressing how they were driven to near suicide before finally being approved for any sort of treatment. So rallying behind the handicapped IDF veterans organization as well as Sadian's family, the demonstrations calling for real change to the system. First and foremost being a reduction in the bureaucracy that leaves all too many wounded veterans alone to suffer unsupported. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in the meantime responding to protests by meeting with the organizers and repeating vows to push meaningful reforms as soon as possible. אני רוצה מפה להודות לך, באמת הכאב הוא מאוד גדול והעיוותים ההיסטוריים הם דרושים תיקון במיידי. אני רוצה להודות לשר הביטחון בני גנץ ולך, אדוני ראש הממשלה, על זה שאתם מתעלים מעל השיקולים, כל שיקול פוליטי, ושמים את פצועות ופצועי צה"ל במקום לא הם ראויים, ובו כל ממשלת ישראל למעשה נרתמת לעזור ולתקן את העוולה הגדולה הזאת. תודה רבה. Well, amid a relatively quiet period between Israel and Gaza, tensions escalating over the weekend with not one but two rocket incidents. On Friday night, a rocket fired toward Israel from the Gaza Strip, landing in open territory. There were no reports of injuries or damage, but the launch did trigger red alert sirens in the surrounding communities. In response, Israeli aircraft hit a series of Hamas targets in Gaza, like a Hamas training camp and a factory producing cement to construct infiltration tunnels. One day earlier on Thursday, another rocket was launched from the Strip toward Israel, with no injuries or damage reported in that case as well. The IDF also responding with airstrikes on Hamas positions in the Strip. Now, speaking of health, a local tragedy April 15th leaving the entire country reeling and demanding responsible reform. The story beginning with the death of 23-year-old Osher Deri due to a severe allergic reaction. Police are calling negligent homicide. This after Derry was accidentally served cream at what is supposed to be a kosher certified meat only restaurant. <laughs> אני רק יודעת שהאח אמר שישיבו אותה במיטה, חיברו אותה אפילו לאינפוזיה, ואז היא איבדה את ההכרה. אני הגעתי ממש כמה דקות אחרי, כבר לא נתנו לי לראות אותה. הלכה לי הילדה, הרגו לי את הילדה. To be deemed a kosher establishment, a restaurant may serve dairy or meat, but not both. So dairy felt safe when she ordered the dessert that killed her. Likewise, having even worked at the meat-only restaurant in the past, she assumed that she didn't need to take her epinephrine pen. The mix-up reportedly occurring, however, when the chef noticed that they were out of whipped cream and ordered a co-worker to run out and get more, the employee allegedly returning with a dairy-based creamer by mistake. And all suspects, including the owner and chef, are now under house arrest at this time. In any case, responding to the tragedy, legislators and medical experts are putting pressure on the government to adopt reforms, starting with forcing eateries to carry EpiPens of their own. And the city of Rishon Lezion, for one, already jumping on the bandwagon. קודם כל ראשי הערים צריכים לקחת את העניינים האלה לידיים. חבר'ה, זה הכרח. ראשי הערים חייבים לעבוד כאן, וחייבים להכניס את זה לכל מסעדה, לכל מקום שיש בו אוכל. הילדה מתה. על כלום. מוות, מוות מיותר לחלוטין. הזריקה הזאת הייתה מצילה את חייה. Well, another tragic story coming from Israel today. A man once beloved by his community and the country is in critical condition after attempting suicide. 
co-founder and chairman of the Zaka Volunteer Emergency Response Organization, Yehuda Meshi Zahav, resigned from the organization after sexual assault allegations against him surfaced, forcing him to turn down a prestigious national award he was set to win. His suicide attempt comes just hours before a television expose was set to air, potentially revealing new details of the allegations against him. While Meshi Zahav has denied all wrongdoing, he turned down the Israel Prize and, of course, resigned from his position. A police official said that investigators found a suicide note in his home. Israel's Channel 12 News issued a statement saying that given the recent developments, its editors will debate whether to air the show at this time. Israeli Air Force fighter jets, including F-15s and F-16s, taking off and touching down side by side with forces from all over the region in a landmark display of military preparedness. The Iniokas 2021 exercise taking place at the Andravida Air Base, including all branches of the Hellenic Armed Forces, as well as air support from France, the U.S., Spain, Cyprus, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates, and the joint military forces reportedly simulating combat scenarios against a range of threats over enemy territory. This in addition to strengthening strategic international ties. Meanwhile, in a similar bid for increasing international cooperations, Greece officially opening its doors to vaccinated and COVID-negative tourists from the EU, US, UK, Serbia, UAE, and Israel, without the need to quarantine. And this after having shuttered luxury resorts and tourism-centered industries since last year. Members of the industry and the government both excited for their livelihoods to resume. As you see, uh, it's a daily routine. We are preparing the hotel in order to to start uh, as soon as the government gives us the green light to, to open. Uh, preparations uh, have not stopped uh, since uh, you know a few months ago. Uh, we know we expect the final protocols uh, of, uh, of the hotels that will be followed. We are ready. We have uh, much more tools in our hands and much more data in our disposal. Uh, this year we have the vaccines, we have the rapid and we have the self-tests. We have the COVID hotels. And uh, I believe that we can, we can give, we can offer an even better uh, hospitality and a higher standard than uh, even what we did last year. Finally, Greek ports of entry likewise opening to the rest of the world May 14th. Industry leaders hoping that visitors will take advantage of the reopenings despite unease over potentially returning restrictions. If uh, normalization will uh, be introduced here by June, I think that by July, uh, COVID will be in the past, but if, if that's not the case, then uh, we're facing an unknown environment and it's going to be very difficult for businesses. Yet. In similar news, Israeli partnerships across the world are getting stronger by the day. The latest effects of the landmark Abraham Accords coming to fruition on Monday, with Sudan abolishing its decades-old law boycotting Israel. The law passed in 1958 forbidding any diplomatic and economic ties to the Jewish state. So with that, Sudanese can now conduct business with Israelis and can travel to Israel freely, including just to visit relatives, as roughly 6,000 Sudanese are living in Israel today. Additionally, the move overturning the up to 10-year prison sentence for violators of the law. But most importantly, the normalization showing a sharp turn from its original role in forming the infamous three no's, which are no peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, and no negotiations. The trio of rejections being approved in Sudan at the Arab League summit of 1967. This next story gives a whole new meaning to the floor is lava. Imagine sitting in your living room watching TV when all of a sudden the floor caves in. That happened to residents of a building on a street in Ramat Gan in Israel. They were then evacuated after the floor collapsed in their ground floor apartment, leaving a massive pit in their living room. The collapse was attributed to nearby construction work on a new building and cellar. One resident said that he and his partner were not at home at the time and found the giant hole upon their return. He added that he was very relieved his dog was not harmed in the incident. All right, happy Earth Day. Today, all over the world, people are cleaning up and turning off the lights to conserve power in honor of the international holiday. This year's theme is hashtag restore our planet. And in honor of this important day, ILTV wants to highlight one individual here in Israel who has made it his mission to keep Israel's beaches clean. 
Julian Melser is cleaning up a Tel Aviv beach, one cigarette butt at a time. My name is Julian Melser. I've been collecting cigarette butts from the beaches in Israel for about three years now. Uh, it's super important because the cigarettes hurt the nature, they hurt the beach, and I love the beach. It's my home, just trying to save the world. Prowling the shore each morning, a large plastic bag in hand, the 26-year-old Israeli treats every day like Earth Day, picking up butts and selling small pouches he calls pocket ashtrays to smokers to deter them from littering. It's what I am. It's what I am. I'm here to protect the world. Of course it's burning. It's, it's burning in my soul. It's burning in my bones. It's burning in my eyes when I see trash in the beach. And um, I can't really think of anything to calm me down other than to go to the beach, clean it up, talk to the people and offer them a solution. Melzer said it's also a living, earning him about $3,000 to $4,000 a month during summer months from the sale of the pocket ashtrays. The Tel Aviv resident has been at it for three years, starting out by creating artwork from butts he collected and then finding a way to recycle his large haul. Stuffing butt-filled plastic bags into boxes, Melser mails them to the No Butts organization in Ireland, which extracts their plastic filters for repurposing. He estimates that he and others in his volunteer group in Israel have picked up about one million butts. I just had to create my own value in this project. I knew how important it was for me, and I knew that uh, I could sell pocket ashtrays. And it started as really as a survival mechanism because of Corona, and I never thought it would turn out to this beautiful, beautiful project where I can actually pay people to clean the beach and raise awareness and talk to smokers. On its website, No Butts said cigarette filters are the most toxic single-use plastic on the planet. It estimates that some six trillion butts are littered worldwide every year. The project is amazing, I think, that shows on the whole world, and it really gets all the love and makes the people of the other people who are the ones 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 who are the ones. Chana Rifkin, ILTV. Moving on, by looking solely at Western media, you might be forgiven for thinking that the Holy Land is nothing but conflict and hardship. But a new trend is gaining speed, showing that many are seeing through the smokescreen and are in fact attempting to move here as fast as possible. Hannah Rifkin with the story. Boca, the Hamptons, Manhattan, Tel Aviv? According to Aliyah organization Nefesh Benefesh, requests for Aliyah or immigration to Tel Aviv, or at least to purchase real estate in the city, increasing by a whopping 126% in 2020 alone. And this despite both the coronavirus pandemic and the popular central city being very well known for its excessive pricing. Especially unique, though, is that interest among Americans has been skyrocketing, with the number of applicants per month rising from 2 to 20. Whereas until now, UK and French immigrants have been known to lead the real estate market in the Tel Aviv area. So why the sudden boom? Particularly as Tel Aviv ranking second in the world after Paris for the average cost of living. In fact, just to give you an idea of the cost, a recent survey reveals that the average price of a four-room apartment in Tel Aviv inflated 36% between 2011 and 2021. Well, the Wall Street Journal is signifying Tel Aviv's high-tech scene as the city's main factor of attraction, but real estate experts also attributing the city's successful draw to its friendly urban environment, which is attracting younger immigrant demographics. Additionally, families and retirees alike are also drawn to the pleasant tropical weather and proximity to the coast. Whatever the case, Tel Aviv is on the rise in the world of foreign property ownership. Now often spoke of in the same breath as famous metropolitan cities such as Manhattan and London. And this upwards trend appearing to only continue for the foreseeable future. Speaking of health, how can you be sure that the products you're using daily on your skin are clean, healthy, and effective? Frankly, what does clean beauty even mean? Well, Manuel Kadosh went to learn about it straight from the source, taking us behind the scenes at one of the leading Israeli cosmetics brands, SR Cosmetics. Beauty all starts from within, which means that the products that we use on our skin must be held to an extremely high standard. We're about to take you on a journey showing you all the ins and outs of SR Cosmetics. The Israeli-based brand focuses around creating healthy and rejuvenating skincare and niche lines that always have a really creative concept to them. SR Cosmetics is considered to be one of the leading brands in Israel in terms of professional cosmetics. 
It was founded more than 20 years ago by Shuli Rodrig, which in herself, she's a guru of aesthetics and cosmetics. Shuli goes all around the world. She's looking for the best herbs and plants which can make uh, our skin better and improve our appearance. And she knows our skin from within. This is why we can uh, not compromise about anything. We're gonna show you guys a behind the scenes look at what it's like to create one of the leading Israeli cosmetics brands, SR Cosmetics. So here in SR Cosmetics, we believe in clean cosmetics, clean beauty, and clean environment. This is really important because you keep your skin better during the years when you do not give it accessible chemicals. This is why we do not use parabens and silicones, artificial perfumes, artificial colorings, and of course also SLS, which can dry out your skin. Every detail is considered, from selecting each precious ingredient to create potent, luxurious, and highly effective skincare. Those ingredients are art craft into formulas that you will never meet. We take our inspirations from arts, from music, from plants, from flowers, and all this goes into our products, and we hear for the passion and the love of beauty. So nowadays we have a website. If you're an end consumer, you will get a specific answer for each of your needs, skin needs. And if you're an aesthetician, you can actually hear Shuli whispering in your ear because we also developed an application, a special app for that. And it mimics and gives everyone the knowledge that Shuli have over the years. Do you think it makes sense that you look like this and I look like this right now? <laughs> Later on in the series, we're going to show you guys an in-depth look into SR Cosmetics specific lines, from the Caviar line to the Peacock line for men, all the way down to the 24 karat gold line. You guys are definitely not going to want to miss this. And that's it for ILTV's weekly review. I'm Aaron Porras. See you next week.